Uh, let's start. First, at all, to tell you that uh, I'm very happy, and I'm sure that all the panelists am, are very happy to have so many people joining this climate forum. And the second thing I want to tell you is that the program was a little bit changed uh, for several reasons I will explain to you. Uh, you had, for those of you who read the paper program, uh, you will notice that uh, very few people are in the paper program, only Ulrich and Simona. All the others you don't know. If you looked at the website, you have also other people you don't know. What happened is very simple. We had a lot of uh, technical and uh, health problems. The person who was supposed to share this meeting is Dorothy Guerrero, which is a woman from the Philippines. As you can notice, I'm not a woman, I'm not from the Philippines, meaning I'm replacing her. <laughs> My name is Christophe Aguiton, I'm French from Attack in France. Uh, I'm very happy to share this meeting, but it was not my job at the beginning. Dotty, uh, Dorothy Dotty, was not able to join because of visa issue. She lives in England and the Great Britain for years now. She's totally legally and still there. She works with Global Justice now. She's married with a British guy. But uh, after several weeks, she didn't get a visa for the Schengen uh, space. That shows at what level, when you are not from the European white people world, it's quite difficult to come here. Uh, to only to notice that, and to notice also that three African people from Togo, Benin, and Senegal were invited, and only one was able to pass after one month and a half of request in the German embassy and the French embassy. That shows a little bit the difficulties. We have always to have that in mind, uh, because it's not a secondary issue. Then the three others missing are Assad Rehman, but also, and that was in the program uh, in the web, uh, Suzanne Shebart and uh, Yulina, I will not want, I want, and Yulia Yurchenko. Yurli, Yulia Yurchenko, it's a Ukrainian activist and researcher who lives in Switzerland, but she got sick. Assad Rehman is a very important uh, activist in the climate justice movement. He was really the spokesperson of the Glasgow coalition. He got sick. And the last one, uh, who is a person from France of the Earth International, I don't know her or, B or Belgium, is Suzanne Shebart. She got sick this night. Okay, but that life, and uh, okay, lucky for them and for everyone, it's not a big sickness, but they are sick, COVID or other things. I, I don't know, but they are sick. But we have other people here who are very good. Of course, Ulrich, I will present him later, is a German professor and very involved in the climate justice movement and social movement. You have also Simona, which is that close to me, which is the representative of uh, the CGEL, the main Italian trade unions working on climate issue. But we have also three other friends who are here, and I'm very happy to have them, and I'm sure it will be great with them. We have Esteban, which is an Argentinian friend, but living in Germany now, and uh, really very involved historically in Greenpeace, I think. No, never with them, but very involved today in Germany in Ande Gelande, and before in Argentina, he was working on the, uh, with the anti-fracking people in his region. Then we have Daniel, I will come back to their name later, which is the responsible for global justice now in Great Britain of the climate justice activity, and he was very active as Assad Rehman in the coalition for the Glasgow uh, COP26 last year. And at the end, we have Payal, which is a very good friend, I'm very happy to have her here. She was the former program director of 350.org, uh, big uh, NGO movement uh, organization, you know them, and um, she's uh, someone who is able to bring in the movement not only the intersectionality but also a decolonial approach, and she's now working with uh, movements and NGOs to organize and campaign on climate issue. It's what she's doing, and she's living in Switzerland. That are the people who are uh, talking now. To add problem to the problem, uh, Payal will have to leave at three, more or less, because uh, we had air in the program when we saw all those sick people, and we thought it would be good to have someone a little bit new uh, in this panel, and we are very happy to have three of you. And uh, Payal will speak the first, and a little bit before three, even if all the panelists didn't uh, finish their speech, if there is a specific question to Payal, that will be an opportunity for her to answer before she rushed to take a taxi 
and a train. The same for Esteban, you have to leave at 4 p.m. sharp. Probably we will have finished, but if we don't have finished, don't be surprised if he's taking his bag and say hello to everyone. Okay, that's for the presentation. Uh, now, I will give the floor to Payal. Everyone will have 10 minutes, 12 at the max, uh, and uh, we will have, after Payal, we'll have Simona, then uh, Esteban, then Daniel, and Ulrich will conclude uh, this uh, panel, maybe with a little break before he speaks or Daniel speaks to let uh, Payal be able to answer to some question. Okay? No question? If it's clear, your turn. Bonjour, guten Tag, hello, um, buenos dias. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here, and I found out about half an hour ago that I was going to speak. So, if it's really boring, that's the reason why. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, the, the climate movement, I have to say, in the last three years, not just here in Europe, but where I'm originally from, also in India, it's had a lot of highs and a lot of lows. I think uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, but more importantly, all the other young people that followed her back in 2018, that gave us such an oomph to the movement and it was the first time in a long time that I felt, wow, we are growing and we're gonna do some big things. And then COVID happened and everybody was stuck in their homes. And unfortunately we know many people um, did not survive in particular uh, in the global south. And now the movement again is trying to find its feet even in the negotiations, they were impacted. Um, w they were also impacted by COVID. But it's very exciting to see that there are so many um, people here and we know we need to have many more people with us if we're going to have a chance at stopping uh, the crisis and creating a world that is fair and just and not just because we don't have CO2 emissions but because we don't have inequality, because we've gotten rid of um, neo-colonialism and everybody has what they need to live and to have a high quality of life. And that's why I'm very excited to hear from uh, Professor Brandt uh, about the work that he's done on this. And I'm also excited, well, I actually will probably miss the rest of you, is Simona talking about the work around just transition with the unions, because that is another example of organizing and in which we've done a very bad job in the ecological movement and the environmental climate justice movement of working with workers who are organized. Um, and without them, we also don't have a chance. And unfortunately, Susie um, from Friends of the Earth Europe isn't here, and she would be talking about the Green New Deal. But that's another case in which if we don't have a strong movement, we will not get a, a Green New Deal. So I'm excited about the possibilities, but I'm tired of coming to events like this. Because when I look, it's a sea of white faces with a few of us who are um, light brown <laughs> to dark brown to black. Um, and we are not going to win this way. Um, we are up against the fossil fuel industry. We are up against state industries. They have a lot of power and they have a lot of money. We don't have either of those. But we need power. And the only way I know that movements can do that is if movements become bigger and stronger. Um, but we can't, it's not going to work if we only talk to people that look like us and act like us or say, well, we ha we're having this meeting, anybody is invited. That's not how it works. Many people don't feel safe, they don't feel comfortable, they don't feel welcomed coming into those rooms. And, you know, I'm not talking about this because I want us to be woke. But I do want us to live our values, and our values are about being open, they're about being transparent, they're about being welcoming. But our movement isn't that. And I'm also talking about it because I don't like to lose. I'm a sore loser and I want to win. And the most effective strategy that I know of is that we have to make our movement wider. We have to let more people in. Why are, why are there not working class people here? I mean, I can even give you an example from Switzerland, from the youth movement, from the Fridays for Future Switzerland movement. There is hardly a face that is not white, hardly a name that isn't Swiss, hardly anybody who has parents who are not from 
um, from Switzerland, you don't have anybody, anybody that is not in the college-bound uh, high school or goes to university. Yet the majority of young people actually um, do a, um, they do a uh, practical and have a practical skill, and they are not there. Um, and yeah, they can't strike on Friday. If you are doing, if you are, uh, you know, three days a week working somewhere and two days a week in school, you can't just not show up to work. But that doesn't mean we don't have them in, in the movement. It means we need to think about how do we welcome them? What do we need to change? What are other tactics and strategies? Because let's be honest, the youth have been doing the strikes for three years now. Um, and everybody knows what they're going to do. It doesn't have as much of an impact anymore. So why not think about new strategies to bring in new people? And <laughs> and when we talk about making the movement wider, it does not mean that the movement is not spikier or it's not focused, it's less focused. It means that if we want to win, we need a wide number of people who are going to feel that they're associated with the movement or at least support the movement. An example I can tell you is in my office. Um, somebody, he's, he's not very left. His daughter um, is in the climate strike movement in Switzerland. And because of her, for the first time in his life, at the age of 49, he started going to demos, and he has more of an understanding. And of course, it's a little bit easier when it's your own daughter, but if you go and take the effort to talk to people about why it's important to you, listen to them, ask them how this issue impacts them, it can really have a difference. And even if they don't say, okay, I'm going to come to every meeting, I'm going to come to every demo, that might not be the case. In Switzerland, we now have a group of uh, immigrant women that cook for us when we have events, because that's their way of contributing to the movement. Most of them are refugees, or they only have a one-year visa. So of course, they're not going to go to a demo, but they cook for us. Um, and, and that's an example, and that's something that came from them, because we took the time to talk to them. And let's see, where are we now? Yeah, and so a couple of examples also, I can tell you, is in Switzerland, we had a CO2 law and a referendum. The left parties refused to go to the rural areas where the people are, are white mostly, but they tend to be poorer and have uh, less access to education or lower levels of education. And what happened? They lost the referendum. Switzerland does not have a climate law right now. And it was because they didn't think those people were worth talking to. But it's just not possible, because if we talk all the time about the 1% and the 10% that are causing the problem, and we're not willing to talk to people that are poor because they don't agree with us on every other issue, uh, we, we've already lost, uh, because we've decided, we, we've basically thrown away a whole portion of the population. And I like to think that that I can get upset about racism and discrimination, but I like to think that people are genuinely good um, and we don't even have a chance to find that out. So I hope that um, I've, I've convinced you that we really need to do this and how we do it is for your groups, I would really suggest you think about mapping and considering what are the communities that would be good to get in touch with. Do we know anyone with connections to them? How can we talk to them? And this is not easy, it's difficult when you decide, okay, we want to talk to these communities, but it also takes time to uh, build trust whenever a relationship is new, and it's completely worth it because if you, if you go slow in the beginning, you can sprint later. And, and you have to be willing to try this and to do this because it really can have gains. And you have suddenly a whole another community that is caring about climate and talking to their networks about it. And I will say finally that um, I come very much from the direct action side of the climate movement in India. I was an activist in a movement where we did a lot of illegal actions. 
Um, but I know now that that is not going to cut it. We need the people doing, we need the people who are doing the research. We need the people that are doing the lobbying. We need the people that are doing the advocacy. We need the people that are cooking for the camps. We need the people that are caring about uh, the activists that have uh, climate depression. We need all of that. And we need to recognize that we need all of that and think about how do we find the synergies with one another as opposed to start arguing about which one strategy or tactic is better. Uh, because if we do that, we won't get any new people and we're not gonna win. So I'll end it at there. Let's change what we're doing so that we can win. Thanks a lot, Payal. It was great. Thanks a lot. And we'll let a little bit of time later if some of you have questions to you, Payal, before you leave. And now we'll give the floor to Simona Fabiani, which is uh, from the CGEL. And she's uh, working there for 10 years now. And she's really working in the development policy and the climate issue. And she attends a lot of COP and mobilization on climate. You have the floor, but I know that you need to show her. You have the, your first slide and you can move them with that. Your turn. You have your mic. <laughs> You, you're talking, it's okay. Okay. Good evening. I'm, I'm very pleasure to be here. And uh, I excuse me if uh, I will read, but my English is not so good, so I think it's more clear. Just Transition is a trade union concept grow up with the climate movement to take together climate and social justice to avoid that the rapid exit from fossil fuel necessary to fight climate change was paid but wasn't paid by workers and communities leaving fossil economy. The struggle have led to some result in official document, as you can say, but they are still not enough. <laughs> so sorry. Over the year, just transition has expanded and is now a transformative concept that uh, not only looks at the energy transition, but at an overall and radical system change toward all sustainable development goals, urgent decarbonization, respect for human and labor rights, social, climatic, environmental and racial justice, intra and intergenerational and gender equity, respect for the right of the indigenous people, communities and migrants, and democratic participation. Just transition needs plans, measures and resources to avoid employment impact, new decent and quality jobs, jobs guarantee, universal social safety nets, permanent training and professional retraining, fight against relocation, reduction of working hours with equal wage, and so on. And to avoid social impact, fight against energy poverty, public investments for structural intervention in energy in energy efficiency and installation of renewable energy system for poor people, public investment to enhance collective public sustainable transport, and so on. The 33rd Agenda is an integrated vision of social, economic, and environmental justice. Sustainable development, in our view, is not economic and GDP growth, but growth of the well-being of the planet and of all living beings. Equity, inclusiveness, peace, respect for human rights, health. SDGs are transformative and incompatible with the capitalism, liberalism, colonialism, patriarchy, racism, discrimination.
For example, in 23rd agenda, there is target 8.5 that uh, say that by 23rd, achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all and equal pay for work of equal value. And you say that we are still very far from full employment and moreover, there are great generational, gender and territorial gaps and gap toward people with disability. Also, poor work is very high. The ecological transition is a big opportunity for job. Here, the year employment data on energy transition with the two one million new job balance. This, not, this does not mean that the transition will be easy. There will be entire sector that will have to close, see fossil fuel and intensive farming. Other that will have to every downsides, like automotive, automotive. For workers who have to lose their job, change is not acceptable if there are no guarantee of being put back into a new job. It's also for this uh, public intervention in the economy is needed to ensure investment in the ecological transition sector and to enhance health, education, research and the creation of new jobs. Climate emergency is already a dramatic reality on which we have the responsibility to act immediately. We are not doing enough and the war in Ukraine and the cap of fossil fuel import from Russia risk being an alibi to slow down the energy transition by aiming for energy security by fossil and now nuclear sources. See also the European taxonomy. EPCC report of last April say time to act is now. I have reported four key messages. We are very far from 1.5 goal. Investment in the transition are three to six, six times less than what we needed. But the report also give us hope. In all sectors, there are technologies that can at least halve emission by 23rd and the availability of capital to fill the investment gap is there. It's, not, it's only necessary to shift them from fossil fuel to new sustainable technology. Human rights are closely linked to the climate issues, starting with the right to life, but in climate negotiation they have never been seriously addressed. In the Paris Agreement, respect for human rights is included only in the preamble, without any commitment for the parties. This year, the COP will take place in Egypt, a country in which the right of freedom of expression, assembly and peaceful protest are not guaranteed. Protests are repressed even with the use of force and activists jailed for their ideas. CGL has decided not to participate for the first time in the COP for not legitimizing the, Egyptian, the Egyptian regime and the choice of the UNFCC that deletes human rights from the climate agenda. The planet resources are limited. We are consuming too much and there are strong inequality. This year we had consumed all the resources available on July 28, but with different responsibility. The overshot day falls 13 March for the USA and 6 December for Ecuador, for example. The same for per capita CO2 emission, USA 14.4 and African countries 0 0.7. Some countries have the responsibility for emission, but are the ones that suffer the greatest consequences of climate change, MAPA. The umbrella the consumers of some countries is based on colonialism that condemning entire population to food, clean water and energy poverty. Current dominant system is unsustainable. We need a radical system change. 
from extractive and linear to regenerative and circular economy, from concentrated wealth to equitable distribution of health and resources, from consumerism to good and service for the well-being of people and the planet, from war and discrimination to, to peace and respect. Change cannot be managed by following the rules of the market and profit. Some things cannot be for sale. Fundamental right, common good, health, peace, education, ecosystem, the air we breathe, climate, full employment, land, water, the right to migrate, and so on. Democratic participation of workers, trade union, civil society, movement, community, in the choice and in the preparation of a strategic plan for the transition is essential to ensure self-determination and respect for the right of communities. The trade union movement has great potential and responsibility in the climate and social justice movement that comes from the strength of history, its value, strong representation, and from his organizational and mobilization capacity. In uh, CGL has developed the programmatic uh, document and proposal to combine climate, social, and economic justice. Here are some of these. CGL commitment is to integrate just transition in all our trade union job, elaboration, bargaining, mobilization, and so on. Stronger alliances and build processes of democratic participation. Here are some examples for the bargaining of the categories, public, metal, chemical, electrical, agricultural uh, work, and so on, that can be developed in national contract and company agreement. And there, some example, always from our platform, of bargaining for sustainable development that can be carried, uh, that trade union confederation can carry it out with the national government and local authorities. Uh, these are some of the main realities which which we collaborate. International Italian Trade Union Confederation, Association, Movement, Coalition, and Campaign. Uh, CGL as always supports all the Fridays for Future strike. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simona. That was very useful. And, and now we'll pass the floor to Esteban, uh, who, as I tell you, come from uh, Argentina. He was very involved in an uh, anti-fracking movement in a place in Argentina, in the north of Argentina, if I'm right, named La Vaca Muerta. And now he's in Berlin, and he will speak in, Spa in, in, in English sorry, for 10 minutes. After him, uh, we will have 10 minutes of possibilities of question and answer to Payal, meaning that if some of you wants to ask specific questions to her, because we'll have a global discussion after the panel, uh, you will go to those two mics, one here, one here, to ask one or two questions no more to Payal. She will have a few minutes to answer, and we will finish the panel with Daniel and Ulrich. Esteban. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you for inviting me. I was invited to come to ESU to tell a little bit of my personal story and the frontline resistance against fracking on the global south, on the other side of the world. Uh, sorry? Uh, um, and what we are doing about it. Um, I couldn't agree more with what the preceding speakers, Simona and Payal, said. Um, we in the global south are being sacrificed for Europe to have gas, for Europe to have materials like mining, uh, the deforestation is advancing, and the situation is only getting more and more hopeless. And I come, I was just, I was not an activist, I was building a, a community in rural Argentina in a province called Mendoza on the west, which happens to be part of the world's second largest shale gas basin and fourth largest shale oil basin, known as Vaca Muerta, a major carbon bomb for the planet. These carbon bombs are not addressed at all in the climate agenda of Europe. 
Not only that, most of them are being exploited by European companies with the support and subsidies of the European governments, especially Germany. I would like to ask who can name here the name of the largest fossil fuel company of Germany? Any hands up? Isn't that crazy? Okay, I saw a hand up. Do you want to? Yes, thank you. Isn't that crazy? Castle is headquartered in Castle and in Hamburg. And when I arrived in Germany three years ago, nobody I talked to, even in the climate movement, even knew the name of its largest fossil fuel criminal, which is leading the fracking operations in Argentina together with Shell, BP, Total, uh, Equinor, and many others from the US, ExxonMobil, and so on. So this hypocrisy, this double standard of Europe has to stop. And Europe needs to put its money where its mouth is and start by preventing its corporations from doing on the other side of the world techniques such as fracking, which they are banned from doing here at home. And for the last few years, you know, I helped build a movement in Argentina against fracking. We leaked a secret document from the government that a whistleblower got to us. We created a platform called EcoLeaks, inspired by WikiLeaks, and in a very South American, low-tech fashion, we leaked that document and it led to huge revolts. Uh, in Mendoza, people have a strong awareness of the, the value of water because water is really scarce, it's a desert. So we had a really strong mobilization and a really strong persecution that followed. So I, was, I became the person of Argentina with the highest number of criminal cases against me for fighting fracking. The media corporations were the same owners of the first company, Fracking Mendoza. The government is just a tool of the corporations to persecute and silence. And my case is just a tiny example. Anywhere you go in the global south, any defenders of water or land are being murdered, are being tortured. Look at Colombia every other day or Philippines. You know, and this is, being, this is happening so that Europe can continue to live the way they're living. And we have been doing global actions, trying to build international solidarity. Because as soon as I arrived in Germany, I noticed this is such a bubble. Just like Payal was saying that she feels, maybe you didn't use the word bubble, but it's a little bubble that we need to break out of. And you do that by talking to people that you're not comfortable talking with, or people on the other side of the planet that is hard to connect with because of the language barriers, the, the geographical barriers. But we need to do that because this fight is international. We have arrived at the climate crisis as a result of the bubbles of nationalism and self-interest uh, and selfishness that we all have lived in in this system of uh, individualism that is destroying the planet. And for the last few years, I've been involved in trying to push Ende Gelende from coal to gas, building international alliances like shale must fall of grassroots around the world, especially Global South, to bring these struggles to the, to the visibility in Europe so at least our people are not being murdered so, so frequently. And over so many years of doing uh, anti-fracking, mining, defending water, water is being privatized, it's being commodified, it's trading in Wall Street, guys. Water is trading in Wall Street. I'm still shocked that in Europe, many people don't even know that. You're running out of water here in Germany. The Rhine is almost uh, not possible to ship stuff through anymore. So this has to do with the bubble of Europe. Like thinking about water is, what is it? Is it too simple a demand? Is it a demand for life? You know, the people in the global south, they're not fighting for 1.5 or all of this shit that comes from Europe. We're fighting for life and for water. And of course we agree with one point. I personally, of course, support the 1.5, but we need to move beyond this into concrete demands and things that we can win because we shouldn't be losing all the time and we are really on our way to losing. And along the way, Along the way, we realize we are never strong enough when we are fighting these extractive industries one by one. You know, it's really hard to engage the workers, for example, when you're fighting fracking or mining, because oftentimes the workers are being promised jobs by these industries and by the government. So sometimes they even try to put the workers against the activists, and they try to create that where the government pulls back and they let it seem like it's a, it's a division in society. But the reality is that I think the climate movement has overestimated uh, its power, especially in Europe, and that the real player, power player in society who can make the wins that we need for the climate fight are the workers. The workers that are the ones that have given us most of the social rights we have today through struggles. 
and through organization and mobilization capacity that far exceeds anything any climate movement has ever done. So if the workers of the world could unite and we could find a way to mobilize them behind the goal of the climate fight, we would be on a winning, on a winning path. But nobody knows how to do that. It's the million dollar question. Everyone is trying, how can we engage the workers? Well, we may have found a way because we, while it's difficult to fight fracking or mining or deforestation or these things in isolation, the global south, my country, especially Argentina, is in a lot of debt, debt. And that is a topic that has not been really discussed much in the climate movement. But many organizations have been working a lot about debt, like here, Daniel and many others. And debt is a well-known mechanism of colonialism called debt trap diplomacy. It's really well described. No one can argue against that. As soon as we became independent from Spain, we went right into becoming neo-colonies of England through debt. The first loan that Argentina got into in the 1820s was not paid back until more than 100 years later and many times over just in interest because while for Germany or the UK or, or, or the US it's really cheap to borrow money, it's a good deal because it's 0% interest, for the Global South the interest rates are usury rates, 10, 20, 30, 40%. So the Global North is making a huge amount of wealth on the interest on the loans to the Global South and here is what is important, the connection of this to the climate crisis. Debt is behind the expansion of the fossil fuel industry in most of the world. Because the governments of the global south have a stranglehold, a knee on the neck, that is forcing them to keep extracting goods that are going to be shipped to the global north to maintain this cycle of excessive consumption that we cannot sustain. So we found that and we found the common denominator we have been looking for that can speak to the workers. Maybe the workers in Europe will be, it will be, uh, it will be some challenge to get to them, but in the global south, when you talk to the workers about, about debt, you got their attention. You know, you talk about the climate crisis or fracking or mining and uh, it's topics that they don't work on or they, they understand that the climate crisis will be a problem, but they're f busy trying to survive. So when you talk about debt and canceling the debt, which is mostly illegitimate to start with because it was granted to dictators and, uh, and things like that, they understand that and they have the power to mobilize. So we've been building this campaign from the Global South together with a lot of groups in the Global North called Debt for Climate. And I don't want to take forever, so I want to invite everyone to get in touch with us. The email is info at debtforclimate.org. And what this campaign is doing is demanding the cancellation of the debts of the Global South so that we can enable a just transition. And this is really important. We have trillions of dollars of debt, of financial debt, to the Global North, and also trillions of dollars of fossil fuels in the ground. So imagine that we can enable a just transition. It would not only benefit the Global South by emancipating from this financial colonialism, because the shape of colonialism today is not, they don't invade us with armies. It's the IMF, it's the World Bank, it's debt. That's what's colonialism today. We would be freed from having to pay huge amounts of money to the Global North and from the pressure to force to continue expanding the fossil fuel industry, enabling a just transition that for the first time a campaign is taking into account the global south. The campaigns for 1.5 or tell the truth or all of these things are of course respectable and we support them, but until now we have not felt represented in the agenda of global campaigns. Europe is always setting the stage, it's always, even the activists of Europe as well meaning as they are, they can't help but be Eurocentric. So we need to build power from the Global South and the workers need to take the lead on that. And I'm happy to tell to you that this campaign is very young. We started this year and we just did an action at the G7 in Munich with 24 countries mobilizing all over the world. The G7 controls the IMF and the World Bank. So they hold the power to cancel the debt and turn it into climate action. So we mobilized thousands around the world. In Argentina, for example, the worker unions took the lead. 3,000 workers in downtown Buenos Aires, unprecedented mobilization of workers for, climate, for a climate campaign. And if we can continue to do that, and the next target will be from October 14th all the way to COP. October 14th is the meeting of the IMF and World Bank, annual meeting. Same time the G20 finance ministers are meeting in Indonesia. Same time, October 15th, 
was the, is the 35th anniversary of the assassination of Thomas Sankara, and groups uh, all the way to COP, they can do actions demanding debt cancellation for climate action. And we need to understand that the workers need to take the lead and maybe the climate movement need to be more humble to work with the Global South and to engage to the workers, even though they don't think like us, they don't have, it's a different language, a different ideology, but unless we, uh, we learn to reach out to those that are not in our bubble, we will be doomed. But Likewise, the reverse of that is that if we come together, we have a strong chances of making important victories for the climate fight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esteban. Okay, I don't see, I see one person, no more for Payal. Okay, you have the floor, no one. Okay, your turn. Ich beziehe mich jetzt nicht nur auf deinen Beitrag, weil ihr ergänzt euch ja auch. Ich würde euch voll darin unterstützen in der Meinung, dass, sag ich mal, ich kann jetzt nur von Westdeutschland sprechen, wir uns mehr um unsere Sorgen damit beschäftigen, als mit dem, welche Auswirkungen das für den globalen Süden hat. Und ich denke, gerade jetzt im Moment ist eine sehr entscheidende Phase, wo mit dem Argument weg vom russischen Gas wir auf einmal wieder zurück zur Atomkraft, zu Flüssiggas oder eben auch unser Bundeskanzler in Kolumbien mit dem, Präsid dem vorherigen Präsidenten, kann ich zum Glück mittlerweile sagen, gesprochen hat, ihr müsst eure Kohleförderung erweitern, damit wir in Deutschland genug Kohle kriegen, um hier einen warmen Winter zu haben. Ich finde das erschütternd und ich finde es noch erschütternder, dass eigentlich, sag ich mal, von den ähm, Klimabewegungen dazu eigentlich gar nichts kommt. Also, dass wir jetzt dann wieder mehr Kohle aus Südafrika kriegen. Also, es ist ja jetzt unabhängig davon, welcher Kontinent, es geht ja ums Prinzip. Und äh, in Kolumbien, also da hat es immer schon eine Solidaritätsbewegung ganz lange gegeben in Deutschland, äh, gegen Blutkohle hieß das, glaube ich, aber das hat auch wenig Resonanz gehabt. Ne? Also die Frage ist, gibt es konkret Ansätze, die sich auch nicht nur auf ein Land, ein Projekt beziehen, also wie meinetwegen Kohleförderung in Kolumbien als Beispiel, sondern äh, was so ein bisschen äh, globaler ist, das heißt, äh, was, äh, ja, wie you. beutet im Prinzip äh, der Norden den Süden aus thank und you, thank you. wo you. können wir uns da zusammenfinden? Ja, yeah. okay. Payal, merci, thank you very much. Payal, you have the time to answer and don't miss your train. Ja, nein. Um, vielen Dank für die Frage. Sie ist eine wichtige Frage. Um, ich würde sagen, aber... Schauen Sie, es gibt überall, Solidarität ist wichtig und es muss wirklich sein, dass von Norden zum Süden, dass man das wirklich auf Augenhöhe macht, oder? Und, aber auf der anderen Seite, was ich kann sagen, ist, schauen Sie, in diesem Moment, es ist das erste Mal, dass man in Europa sagen kann, nicht, dass äh, äh, der Klimawandel kommt, der Klimawandel ist da, oder? Das können wir sagen seit zwei, drei Jahren zu jeder Person. Aber wir wissen auch, und Herr Brandt könnte wahrscheinlich noch besser antworten, dass, dass wir wissen auch, dass die Zukunft darf nicht Atomkraft sein, es darf nicht Gas sein. Und es ist eigentlich eine, eine Möglichkeit, eine Chance mit Leuten hier in Deutschland darüber zu reden und zu sagen, deswegen brauchen wir diese Transition. Und ich würde sagen, wenn Deutschland und andere europäische Länder dann wirklich sagen, wir kommen weg von fossilen Brennstoffen und wir kommen unter 1,5 Grad und wir bezahlen, was wir sollen im, im Süden, das bringt uns, uns viel weiter, meiner Meinung nach. Es ist sehr wichtig, Deutschland ist so ein wichtiges, großes Land, ganze EU. Und ich denke, wenn ihr hier sie unter Druck stellt und mit solchen Forderungen, dann haben wir gewonnen. Aber es heißt, es heißt genau, wie es, ähm, Esteban gesagt hat, man muss mit anderen reden. Die Leute vor allem, die können jetzt nicht mehr Benzin bezahlen. Mit ihnen reden und dass sie verstehen, warum man sagt, trotzdem, dass es nicht der Weg und Alternative zeigt, sodass wir langfristig weiter leben können und Wasser haben. 
Thanks a lot, Payal. Now we'll follow with the two last speakers and then we'll open the floor to everyone. Uh, Daniel now. Daniel is coming from Great Britain. He works with Global Justice now and he was very involved in the Glasgow mobilization and still very involved in the global uh, justice, in the climate justice movement. Thanks. Thank you, Christophe. Uh, and yeah, thank you, Payal, uh, uh, Simona, and, and Esteban for your presentations so far. <laughs> Uh, I think one of the things that the kind of threads that runs through the, the presentations that we, we've heard so far is that the, the question that uh, collectively we have to answer is not just about uh, reducing carbon emissions or, or putting global warming uh, in its, you know, halting it in its tracks, um, but it's also about repairing the damage that our economic system has done to the planet and also about how we achieve justice between the global north and the global south. Um, even if we were able to halt global warming at 1.5 degrees or, or less tomorrow, there would still be a huge climate debt that the global north owes to the global south. And what we mean by that, that climate debt is, uh, as Simona uh, pointed out with, with the graph, uh, the global north has contributed between two-thirds and, and three-quarters of overall carbon emissions to global warming. Uh, when we count excess emissions, that's kind of emissions uh, that exceed each country's fair share, the global north has contributed 92%. Um, and the impacts of this, uh, as well as the causes of climate change, are undoubtedly colonial. When countries in the global south are forced to extract more fossil fuels, uh, when they have economic opportunities to develop denied to them, uh, and when they're paying right now for uh, sort of losses uh, and economic damages to their countries because of the cyclones, uh, and storms that are impacting countries each year with more intensity, uh, then it becomes a question of uh, how do we repay this debt? How do we first of all recognize it, uh, that it's not the countries of the global south who uh, owe rich nations uh, financial debt, it's the countries in the global north that owe the south this climate debt. And what kind of mechanism can we create uh, to, to repair that and, and to pay it? Uh, and movements from across the global south for, for many, many years have been thinking about this in terms of, of reparations or climate reparations. Uh, and I'll say now um, I'm going to focus on one part of the, the kind of story of reparations. Um, but many of these social movements from uh, the descendants of enslaved peoples uh, who were trafficked across the Atlantic, uh, to the Pan-African diaspora, to migrant groups, uh, to social movements across Latin America, South Asia, uh, and Africa, um, have talked about reparations of, often as a way of uh, repairing the harm done by Europe nation, European nations during the colonial period. Uh, and we see that today in movements kind of such as in the Caribbean, uh, making demands for, for reparations from the British royal family, uh, quite rightly. Uh, but increasingly, climate movements within the kind of UN COP space uh, have talked about also this idea of climate reparations, uh, of how do we raise the money uh, to pay for the global south to transition to renewable energy, uh, to adapt to the impacts of climate change, and to pay for the losses that have already happened. Uh, and I think the crucial question here is, uh, again, I'll come back to you, Simona, about uh, how do we ensure that uh, if the global north is paying, that it's not the workers in the global north, but it's the, the criminals and, and the rich who are... Uh, who are paying for, the, for that debt. Uh, the, the response of the, the US uh, and uh, the European Union and the UK uh, historically has been trying to sort of narrow down this idea of reparations to uh, an act of charity and to make it uh, about writing a check that can be then uh, dismissed to, to silence the debate. Uh, in 2009, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton uh, sort of led this, uh, led this attempt and tried to pay off the Global South with the idea of $10 billion a year. Um, that was something that was not based on the needs of the Global South. Uh, there was no uh, calculation or estimate behind it. Uh, it was sort of plucked out of the air as a kind of uh, offering of scraps to the table. Uh, and eventually, uh, when uh, the, you know, negotiators from the Global South and leaders said, this isn't good enough and we're going to leave the talks, they were persuaded to, to uh, increase that to $100 billion a year. But again, 100 billion a year is not a figure based in reality. Uh, estimates of, of what the cost will be 
uh, range from uh, sort of 400 billion a year to 2 trillion uh, by 2050. Uh, and this is just all part of the political process in which the demands for debt cancellation, uh, for the dismantling of a racist border system, uh, for huge transfers of technology and finance uh, that have been made by social movements around the world have been narrowed down by rich countries in the UN into this uh, very uh, narrowly defined kind of idea of what is called climate finance. Uh, and they can't even do that right, really. Uh, the target for, for that 100 billion a year was uh, to be delivering it by 2020. Uh, we're you know, uh, more than two years past that now, and rich countries still aren't contributing to that. Uh, and when you look at where the finance is coming, it's all coming from the same financial institutions that hold debts from the global south. It's coming in the form of loans. Uh, so uh, companies are actually making a profit off uh, this finance that they're going to the global south. Um, and it's, it's completely uh, directed by the needs of the global north. So a completely different approach to this kind of uh, finance is needed. Uh, but I think the, the uh, heartening thing about this is that we do have what is potentially a historic opportunity to change the narrative. Uh, these kind of demands for climate reparations have uh, re-emerged again in recent years, partly driven by uh, some of the youth groups that we've talked about already. Uh, and on the 23rd uh, of September, there'll be a global climate strike uh, to raise funds, uh, to call on rich countries to commit to raising funds for loss and damage uh, and for climate reparations. And that will be led by uh, the Fridays for Future mapper group uh, from the most affected people in areas. Uh, but to build on that kind of momentum that's happening, we also have to, I think, look uh, inward to an extent in the global north and look at what's happening here. Um, the top five energy companies around the world, so that's BP, Shell, Chevron, ExxonMobil, and Total, uh, collectively have contributed more than 10% to global warming. So of all historic carbon emissions, uh, those five companies have contributed more than 10%. Uh, and rather than facing any accountability, rather than being uh, held up in uh, The Hague or in criminal court for these actions, in the past three months, those five companies have made a collective 60 billion euros profit. So whilst this is uh, an outrage and whilst it's uh, really kind of revisiting uh, the power of these corporations back on the people of the global north, I think it is an opportunity to unite the causes of the communities uh, in the global south facing climate damages right now and the workers who are getting ripped off by these uh, extreme household energy bills. Uh, and it's, it's a time really to, uh, to think about how can we ensure that these corporations are the people who pay for the climate damages. Uh, movements in the past have talked about countries in the global north contributing 2 to 6% of GDP to uh, climate reparations each year. And that is, in a time of economic recession, uh, you know, and, and economic instability in Europe, uh, quite a big ask to make of, uh, of people if, you know, if we want to include workers uh, and the most marginalized groups uh, in the global north in this process of climate justice, we have to be very clear that if we're talking about a, pro a program of reparations, that it's the corporations who pay, it's the polluters who pay. Um, but we have to really make use of this opportunity to do that. Um, at Global Justice Now, we're kind of sort of trying to build on this, uh, work with our allies in the Global South to develop this campaign. Uh, we work with groups in the UK who connected into networks like Can International and the Loss and Damage Youth Collaboration, uh, who in the run-up to COP27 will be putting a lot, lot of effort into campaigning uh, for rich countries to agree climate compensation, what's called loss and damage at the, in the UN. Um, and that absolutely has to be fun funded through taxation on these companies uh, by reducing their profits down to zero and by making sure that if, while some of the money is going towards uh, reducing those household energy bills, that a lot of it is also going to pay for the climate impacts of our worst polluters. Um, and I think this is also, I mean, this is a kind of campaign that we've started developing uh, in the UK, but as Esteban's highlighted, there are many of these big corporate polluters across Europe uh, apart from the ones I've mentioned, there's all, also companies like RWE and Uniper. Uh, Repsol, the Spanish oil company, uh, is facing demands from uh, Peruvian fishing communities because of a huge oil spill uh, that, was, that happened there at the start of this year and that has destroyed not only ecosystems but also uh, labor opportunities for communities there. Uh, but Repsol denies any responsibility and they won't pay compensation. 
Uh, RWE is fo facing a, a compensation claim from uh, a farmer, also from Peru, uh, because of the impacts that their co uh, carbon emissions have had on the glacier, uh, which threatens the town of Huaraz. Uh, they refuse responsibility and refuse to pay compensation. Um, so I, I think this is just a point at which we need to start changing the narrative. We've got a, a huge opportunity and a huge amount of uh, political and public will against these companies uh, that we can build on. But rather than uh, any of the demands just stopping at simply uh, bringing down energy prices or even nationalization, we need to make sure that uh, the global impacts of what these companies have been doing is felt uh, and that climate compensation and reparations are uh, at the front of demands for what they should be paying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Then we'll have Ulrich Brand, who is a teacher, a political scientist, professor of international politics in Vienna, the University of Vienna, working in particular with Latin American movement, but he's also working closely with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, and I'm very happy to have him concluding this uh, table. But before to give him the floor, only to tell you that after his uh, intervention, we will have the possibility to have questions in both sides of the room, as you know now. Uh, you can go there uh, all together at the beginning, to have an idea of how many people wants to uh, give a comment or ask a question, to know how many time I can give to everyone. And uh, meaning that after Ulrich, we will have uh, 30 seconds of time to let you go to the mic. But if you have a question or a comment, it's now or never. Okay, Ulrich. <laughs> yes, good afternoon, everybody. Many thanks for the invitation to this, I think, important forum to exchange experiences. And since I'm the last presenter, I would like to thank, in the name of all of us, to those who enable our international debate. These are the translators, and I ask you to give a warm applause to the translators. Thank you. I just came back from Chile and Argentina. Um, there was an international conference of the um, new constitution in Chile. There will be a referendum the 4th of September, and then I spent some days in Argentina. And first of all, I would like to share, to share that in Chile, there is now a very strong bottom-up movement, door by door, to convince people that they have to approve the new constitution, the right the political elites are against the new constitutions. They have the money, they put the money, and it's really a bottom-up process, and I think we can learn from those experiences um, that how important it is to mobilize people beyond our bubble, since we discussed that at the beginning. And the second, since um, Esteban was um, uh, mentioning Vaca Muerta, the second largest um, gas fracking field in the world, um, I read Pagina Dose, which is a yeah, center government um, oriented, but also center left uh, daily. And they had an article on the Revolución Energética, the energy revolution. And I was quite surprised, but the energy revolution in Argentina for the current government, which is a Peronist uh, progressive government, is to get gas at any price. Exactly this. It's not to have an energy transition in our sense, but to get the gas out of the uh, of the of the stones of the earth to sell it on the world market. So this is a bit the constellation we are in. Dorothy and Christoph uh, asked me to talk about a solidary mode of living, um, to to um, complement a bit uh, this um, this panel, and um, this came up in a book I published with my friend colleague Markus Wissen on the imperial mode of living. We have tomorrow morning a workshop on this. Join us if you like at ten, and um, I. Um, Want to our starting point, and I think this is important when we talk about strategies, is of course it's about economic power. Daniel um, mentioned the five companies responsible for 10% uh, of the global emissions. It's about political power. It's about a new Cold War, maybe, which is facing us. But it's also a struggle against an attractive attractiveness of the Western way of life that many people, of course we are all exceptions, but many people in our countries want larger cars, want more and more and more. And this is a subjectivity. It's not yet, for some it's also agreed, but it's also because the social conditions of this are there. If you live in the countryside and you don't have public transport, you need a car, or many who have money, they just want uh, to get a bigger, bigger car. 
So the, w the imperial mode of living, the main idea of this, I'm very brief, and then I come to the solidary mode of living, is that in our societies of the global north, but also in the global south, if you go to Buenos Aires or to other uh, regions, it's still attractive to live via referring to cheap labor and cheap nature elsewhere. Yeah? We exploit, as Esteban said, the global south, or with uh, the climate debt and others. And this is not because people are bad, but because this is the very condition of our life, of the political, cultural, economic, and other conditions, and north-south conditions. So, um, Antonio Gramsci, a famous um, theorist a hundred years ago, called this hegemony, which is not domination by coercion, but there is a consent in our societies. And our task is to also irritate this consent, of course, to, to also to change power relations, to avoid that the, the large companies can do what they want. But a, a, a terror of struggle for us is the everyday consciousness of people via um, the, the, the uh, mobilizations, via campaigns, via um, the last generation um, activities now in Germany and elsewhere. So this is a, a brief outline, uh, a brief idea, not more. A solitary mode of living has as a major principle for climate justice, a global climate justice, not to live at the cost of others, not to exploit others, to get our stuff here, the smartphones, uh, cars, uh, clothes, etc., etc., and not to exploit nature, not to live at the expense of nature. And as we say in the announcement of this panel, a good living for all on a livable, livable planet. But if we consider that it's not just important enough to build up movements, yeah, I don't want to question this, but if we take seriously that a capitalist mode of production and living an imperial mode of production and living is deeply inscribed in everyday relations, in everyday desires, beside economic and political power, we have to consider this. And to, we have to strategies also to change this, to, have, to change the infrastructures, the material infrastructures, the, the, the conditions people are live uh, under. In that sense, we would argue Social movements are important, but it's not the clear-cut constellations. Here are the progressive movements, and we fight the rest of the world, but we have to look, and I'm happy that Simona is here, and, and Christopher, um, he, who worked so much, so long for, or, or still is working with trade unions, that this is also uh, important. So, this is impo um, the point is, it's not a clear-cut confrontation. Here are the movements. They have to be more diverse. They have to grow, and there is the rest of society, but we have to think strategically how to convince workers, how to convince trade unions, how to even change state policies. What is this, who is the state personnel? What is an alternative economy? Um, uh, um, um, uh, yeah, the alternatives within the economy um, in transport, in closing, in the production of our, um, of our daily food, etc., etc. And um, to be brief, um, the, we have so many good experiences. We know that an alternative mobility system has to avoid the, the, the um, focus on cars. It's a trap. It's a historical trap and fall to think that now in Germany we can change 50 million cars from the combustion engine to the um, electric engine. This is the false story. This is a trap. This is the an, an, an attempt of an ecological modernization of capitalism at the cost of the lithium triangle in Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. So we know that a good mobility system of a solidary mode of living is mainly public transport, is mainly to avoid the so-called forced mobility that people have to travel 50, 60, 60 kilometers per day to, to other places. We know, even from the FAO, that a good nutrition system, a good agricultural system, must be agroecological and cannot be industrialized etc., cetera, um, et cetera. So we know this. So to, to um, conclude, um, yes, I think that workers are crucial. I did a lot of research on this, and I um, collaborate with many, um, with the Chamber of Labor, for example, in, in, in Austria and with trade unions in Germany. But I would not overburden us 
I would not say we have to now to talk to the workers and convince them. This is, we can do this as well, but this is a major task of the trade unions and of the workers' councils and of the workers themselves. So I would not criticize us too much to say, oh, we are here middle class um, uh, interested. It's good that we are here, and I hope that we have other fora and we have other concept, just transition, which is so important, and that within this sphere, within, um, within the sphere of work, of trade unions, of worker struggles, social ecological transformation and ecological issues come, become more important. I hope I get, uh, I, um, you, you get it. It's not that I think it's not important, but the global justice movement cannot be overburdened to say, ha ha, you, you cannot convince the workers. Of, sure, of course we should try, but the ma it's the major task of the, of the trade unions, of the workers themselves. A second final thought is, and I think this became very clear here on the, on the, on the panel, we should, be more, we should be radical, but we should be uh, modest. We as a global justice movement or as an ultra-globalization movement, as we are here as a, a attack and others, we, we are not strong, but we are, str we are not strong in the overall setting, in the societal setting, in the, in the big picture. But we are strong, and we were ever, always strong, when we identified concrete conflicts and then carried out concrete campaigns. We, we, I will come back on this in the, in the um, evening panel. So, the climate reparation campaign, a campaign to, to not to um, exploit lithium in, in Latin America, a campaign for just transition, etc., etc. This is our strength. But we should not imagine ourselves as, here is the big picture, here is the, the war, the climate crisis, uh, the, the far right, etc., etc., and we have to act comprehensively. This, this will not work. And I think we should not overburden and overload us also. We should identify concrete conflicts now in the, f the upcoming fall, the energy price, and, so, and then um, go into it. And we should support the conflicts in the global south. Yeah, this is really important to consider, and this was always a strength of the alter globalization movement, to have this international and internationalist perspective to look at the global south. I finish really now with an announcement. I don't go into detail, but we had a, a, a bit um, then two years ago in Vienna, some of you might have um, participated, it was online, um, of course, in times of Corona, an international conference on degrowth and strategy. And there were 4,000 4, participants online, and we tried to understand how can we push the agenda of degrowth. And I just, just want to make it clear, also to talk to uh, trade unionists, degrowth is not about ecological austerity. Degrowth is not that uh, it's good that we have an economic crisis. Degrowth is about getting rid of the capitalist growth imperative. It's, I think this is an important distinction, that our well-being, our material well-being is mainly organized under capitalist conditions and to get rid in the very concrete conflicts again of um, food production, of mobility production, of health, of um, education, etc., etc., to fight against this capitalist growth imperative and to rethink what is a model of well-being or in my words, what is the solidary mode of being, uh, uh, of living. I'm sorry. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for, for this last uh, intervention. Now I ask to all of those who want to ask a question, have a comment, whatever, if possible to go there. Uh, Chairman, that's too rich. <laughs> uh, if you want to write something, you can also do it as you, will, you just did. Okay, two person here, go to the mics. One person here. Go there, go there, go down. <laughs> okay. You will have to answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Okay, four here, that's it, three here, no one else. Okay, no more than two minutes each one, uh, less if you want, no problem, but no more than two. Who start there? You, you start? Non, mais posez-la là-bas. Non, non, mais pas à moi, pas à moi. Non, 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 je veux pas savoir. OK, the first one start here. And you can come to ask. Uh, go ahead. OK, thank you. Um, hope you hear me. Uh, my name is Hanna. I'm a Ukrainian, currently based in Switzerland. So my question is about uh, our position uh, towards the energy crisis in relation to the uh, war, Russian war in Ukraine. Uh, so the longer this war uh, goes on, the more popular discontent in the Western countries uh, will grow uh, as a result of uh, energy shortage and uh, economical consequences of sanctions and war, especially in Germany, where a lot of people will feel like their way of life is in danger. And uh, the cra this crisis, we will face it like in a few months. And certainly it would also be used by right-wing populists. And the German and Western capital, they want to continue their business as usual, buying Russian gas and oil and providing a Russian elite with all the necessary commodities. Uh, and if Ukrainians were not so uh, stubborn, they, will already, they would already conclude a deal, a deal with Putin. And uh, yeah, the Western elites are among those who are responsible for the war because for years they were trading with uh, Putin's regime uh, in total impunity. So we are now, I think, in a dangerous situation uh, where the social crisis uh, will hit us very hard and my question is that uh, you and your maybe organization that you represent uh, what will be your response in a few months when we will face this uh, social crisis how do you articulate uh, the response to the energy shortage and uh, the war in ukraine thank you very much thank you anna now someone there We want to speak about a concrete conflict and uh, Saturday we have the red line near of Mönchengladbach in Lützerath and we want very short announce our action for Saturday only one minute. This is a short advert advertisement. Thank you very much. And if you want to give some explanation in few words here, you are more than welcome. It's a very good initiative, and I hope a lot of us will be able to join. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We know the message next Saturday, tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Okay, okay. And for the people who have, want to have more explanation, you have it in the program, in the written program, or in the website. Uh, your turn. Hello, my name is Martin Kessler. I'm a German filmmaker and we shoot more than 10 years with the social movements in Brazil in the Amazon region against the, th the construction of the third biggest stem of the world, Belo Monte. And we will show this documentary today at 4.30 here in room 200. And you can see there in this documentary, it's a work more than 10 years, it's uh, 90 minutes. And you see all that, what you discussed here, in a very um, example. 
and I would like to invite you to come and discuss this. Thank you. Yeah, I really support this idea. Belo Monte was one of the worst dam built in Amazonia, and to go to see this movie, I'm sure it's very instructive and people will learn a lot. Okay, it will be in an English version, but I'm sure that the images are talking by themselves. Thanks a lot for this proposition. Your turn. Hello. Hi, my name is Leah from War on Want, and I have a question about what I see as maybe possible tensions between the position of Daniel and Esteban, so I wanted to ask him questions about that. I can see that you're, you're fully on board. But, um, so what is the financial equivalent of asking for debt relief for climate? Because we had some figures thrown around, 400 billion a year to 2 trillion a year. So I'm just wondering what the equivalent is and I guess a question that came up for me in hearing about that, which is you know, an exciting proposal, is that would you not then be left with a situation where you'd have countries that have been given debt relief that may not be in particular in climate stress, and you had others that didn't have, happened to have particularly large debt that really needed climate finance? And so I have another question in, in thinking about like, what has the response of the, both the debt justice movements and the climate justice movements been from this in a context where there is a process to have a separate, um, you know, through, through the UNFCCC, there's a process where by, by these, these agreements around 100 billion a year are being negotiated, and, and has there been sort of pushback, I guess, on the combination of those, those demands? Um, so, so, yeah, I guess just to, to ask the panelists whether, whether they see any, any conflict with their, their particular um, positioning around those demands. Thanks. Thank you. Your turn. Two questions, mainly for Daniel Willis, I think. When it comes to uh, climate finance and lama, uh, loss and damage, uh, wasn't it an idea to tax international transport and give uh, the tax revenue to the Global South? That was proposed by World Wildlife Fund and Oxfam back in 2011. They proposed a starting tax of 25 US dollars, but you could certainly increase that every year. So that will first of all raise an enormous amount of money and secondly it will be favors or local production of every kind including agriculture that's my first thing why i th to, to cancel the debt complete support but i think maybe a international car, uh, tax on international transport would tackle two questions money and reducing emissions from international transport which is the sort of sixth or seventh largest emitter in the world. Second question, um, sort of to get away from imperial living, shouldn't we block sort of the, the main greenwashing strategy of the big corporation, which is offsets? So don't get into any technical particularities when it comes to paragraph six and so on. Just say, offsets completely out of the uh, COP framework, of the UNFCC uh, framework, full stop. Thanks. For those of you who are not familiar with that, offset is the idea that you can compensate what you are spending in carbon gaze, gas on creating a forest in Amazonia or wherever. That's the offset. Okay, uh, here. My question, my question is about the role of trade unions. Since I've participated in a few workshops um, combining class struggle and climate movement lately in different occasions, there's a big consensus that the workers need to be approached in some way or the other. But uh, uh, the role of the trade unions does not seem to be so clear because there's many, uh, there's a lot of skepticisms about the flexibility and uh, um, like. The, the 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 outreach that the trade or let's say that the trade unions are the strategically um, willing due to the structural um, maybe a structural link to the uh, capitalist companies that they are able to actually do this kind of um, mobilizing the workers that needs to be done for the the climate movement as well. So I was wondering, since uh, Ulrich said that uh, we should not concentrate on these issues, but let the trade unions do that, 
or maybe approach them in a strategic way, and since there are trade unions on, on the, uh, up front as well, and, I, I, and the international campaign, I don't know how they want to approach the workers, if it's also through, through trade unions, or is it a direct approach? Thank you. You want to talk? Your turn. <laughs> mm, I would like to ask if it's possible to, uh, to um, say my question in uh, German to translate for the um, community. Uh, I would last, uh, like to ask uh, why in this ex um, ach nee, genau. Um, warum tatsächlich für wenn es um Klimagerechtigkeit geht. Second. Don't forget that people can speak in German or French. Put your um, Warum tatsächlich also eine Geschlechter ähm, um, äh, Falschverteilung da ist, immer wenn es ums Klima geht und um Geld geht auf dieser Welt, sage ich mal, nicht nur in Europa sitzen dort vier Männer und eine Frau, selten umgekehrt. Was ist die ähm, Umgang mit Geld und äh, mit der Ausbeutung dieses Planeten? Ähm, sag ich mal, wo, wo ist da die Geschlechtergleichverteilung? Warum werden tatsächlich mehr Männer als Experten gesehen für diese Klima- und Geldkrise auf dieser Welt? Thank you. <lacht> your, your turn. Ja, äh, mein Name ist Manfred, ich komme aus Krefeld, hier direkt aus der Nachbarschaft. Eine Frage an Daniel Wills. Willis. Ich hoffe, ich habe nur falsch verstanden. Vielleicht war es auch eine falsche Übersetzung. Aber wenn er sagt, nicht die Menschen und die Arbeiter sollen diesen Finanztransfer, diesen Ausgleich, diese Rückzahlung, wie er es genannt hat oder wie man es nennen kann, bezahlen, sondern die Staaten. Ja, der Staat ist nach Marx der Generalunternehmer. Das sind dann wieder die Menschen und die Arbeiter, die den Staat über Steuern finanzieren. Ich glaube, da muss man weiter nachdenken, wenn ich das richtig verstanden habe oder ich habe alles falsch verstanden. Thank you. Your turn. Okay, I'm Margarita and uh, my question is, Why don't we always include the military and all the war um, emissions in our uh, climate justice calculation? Yeah, it's uh, never part of the calculations. <laughs> and uh, to to me, uh, peace is. Um, the condition, the precondition for survival. Yeah? And that we have to bring that into our consciousness and into, the, in, into our um, work, into our movement. Thank you. Thank you. Your turn and then. Yeah, uh, es ist hier heute mehrmals betont worden, dass es wichtig ist, dass sich die sozialen Bewegungen der Klimafrage annehmen und dass die Klimabewegung sich der sozialen Frage annimmt. Bei Attac Deutschland haben wir das Motto sozial-ökologische Transformation und wir achten darauf, dass es da ein Gleichgewicht gibt. In Deutschland hat auch Fridays for Future das schon erkannt. Da gibt es auch sozusagen den, den Versuch, das zusammenzubringen. Ich war gestern auf einem, in einem Workshop, äh, Christoph, du warst auch dabei, äh, wo es um die, äh, die Einschätzung, die Situation der sozialen Bewegung in der neuen, äh, neuen politischen Weltlage ging. Ihr habt eine Stunde lang äh, sozusagen Analysen gebracht. Das Wort Ökologie und das Wort Klima kam kein einziges Mal davor. Ich frage mich wirklich, und das ist vielleicht auch eine Frage an Christoph, was, wie ihr das in Frankreich diskutiert, ob, äh, oder ich zweifle daran, dass in großen Teilen alter linker Organisationen die Klimafrage, äh, das Überleben, die Notwendigkeit sozusagen diesen Kapi fossilen Kapitalismus, den fossilen Kapitalismus abzuschaffen, ob die dort schon angekommen ist. Dankeschön. Thank you. I think the last one is you, Annick. Uh, Annick, uh, d'Attaque France, je parle en français. 
je suis aussi syndicaliste. Je voulais intervenir sur cette question de l'alliance nécessaire et indispensable sur la question des enjeux écologiques et des enjeux sociaux à partir de l'expérience que nous avons en France d'un collectif qui s'est constitué il y a deux ans et demi, qui s'appelle « Plus jamais ça » et qui se définit comme une alliance pour une rupture écologique et sociale qui regroupe euh, une partie du mouvement syndical français, notamment la CGT, mais d'autres organisations syndicales aussi, des associations comme ATTAC, mais aussi euh, des organisations comme Greenpeace ou Oxfam ou la, ou la Confédération Paysanne. Il me semble que c'est quelque chose de, de complètement inédit que des organisations syndicales et que des organisations de type Greenpeace acceptent de travailler ensemble de façon permanente et durable, euh, C'est quelque chose, en tous les cas, euh, dans le mouvement social français, qui est complètement inédit. Il y avait des expériences de mobilisation ponctuelle qui ont pu se faire dans le passé, mais qui étaient très limitées, et notamment sur le fait que la participation d'une organisation comme la CGT euh, était en général pas acquise, puisque y a, bon, la CGT, par exemple, a longtemps porté la défense du nucléaire. Donc vous imaginez bien que les discussions entre cette organisation syndicale et Greenpeace pouvaient être compliquées. Or je crois que ce qui a fait bouger les choses, c'est qu'il y a du côté des organisations syndicales la compréhension que l'enjeu écologique et de la crise climatique est incontournable et que ça a des conséquences pour le monde du travail, je ne vais pas développer là. Et de l'autre côté, je pense qu'il y a une prise de conscience du point de vue des grosses ONG type Greenpeace ou d'autres, que sans prendre en compte les enjeux sociaux, on ne réussira pas une véritable rupture euh, écologique. Et je crois que ce qui se passe depuis deux ans et demi, c'est à la fois le fait qu'il y ait eu adoption d'une plateforme commune avec une trentaine de revendications, notamment au moment de la crise du Covid, mais aussi une lutte concrète assez exemplaire qui a permis de sauver des emplois. C'était une lutte dans l'ouest de la France d'une imprimerie papetière, de papeterie qui fabriquait du papier, qui était rachetée par une grosse multinationale et qui voulait arrêter cette production de recyclage de papier. Et il y a une lutte qui a été appuyée évidemment par le syndicat, par la CGT, organisée par la CGT, mais qui a été appuyée par des actions avec ce collectif « Plus jamais ça ». Et ça a créé un rapport de force au-delà de, de, du seul endroit où ça se passait. Et cette lutte a été victorieuse. Non seulement ça a permis de conserver des emplois, donc l'aspect social, mais pour un projet industriel qui est de recyclage du papier. Je ne développe pas davantage. Ce que je voulais simplement dire, c'est que cette alliance, elle tient pour trois raisons, à mon avis. C'est une compréhension que ni le mouvement social d'un côté, ni le mouvement écologique de l'autre ne gagneront séparément pour imposer cette transition, cette rupture écologique et sociale, mais aussi avec l'idée de mener ensemble des luttes concrètes. Voilà. Et ce que, juste pour terminer, je dirais que ça fait bouger les lignes dans les débats, dans les organisations elles-mêmes. Il est évident que dans la CGT, il y a des débats et des discussions compliquées sur le fait de prendre en charge ces enjeux écologiques. Dans les ONG type Greenpeace ou d'autres, il y a aussi des débats pour dire est-ce que c'est bien nécessaire de faire alliance avec des organisations avec qui on n'est pas 100% d'accord mais en tous les cas, il y a l'idée que c'est ensemble qu'on trouvera euh, les voies qui permettront de répondre à ces, gens, à ces enjeux. Merci. Merci Annick. OK. Uh, I think no one else wanted to talk. Then we will come back to the answers from the panel. And I will ask to Esteban, who have to leave anyway at four o'clock, whatever happened, to start to answer to some of the questions. Sure, thank you. Uh, I will focus on the person who asked about the, how to quantify the climate debt and the potential discrepancies between my friend Daniel and myself. So, uh, Daniel, pretty much what he's explained about reparations, loss and damage, climate debt, is the perfect complement to what I was saying. I didn't get to mention it because he was going to talk about it also, and I was rushing so that Payal could answer a question before she had to leave. But basically, you have to look at it this way. Uh, this is the way we, we are doing it. Um, the climate debt of the global north 
is in the order of trillions or quadrillions. It has not been properly quantified. But the climate debt is not only the emissions, which can be easily, more easily quantified, but you also have to put a number to, to the reparations and loss and damage, all the colonization and enslavement of most of the world for half a millennia. So the financial debt that we are talking about in debt for climate is a small, tiny bit compared to the climate debt of the global north. It's true that they owe us a lot more than we owe them. So they are the ones that should pay. What we have found, and the climate debt needs to be paid through, canceling the financial debt, paying reparations, paying loss and damage, and enabling climate finance that is not more loans. Careful, because they want to finance this with debt. It needs to be interest-free money. So we try to look at this strategically, because as Payal said, we want to win. We need to make victories. We're not just talking the talk because it sounds nice and we love the, the sound of our voice. There's enough of that going around. So we found that the debt, the financial debt, is the weakest link of the chain because it's preventing the global south from achieving a just transition today and it's fueling the expansion of the fossil fuel industry contrary to all the claims of the governments here. The Paris Agreement is bullshit. The Global Methane Pledge is bullshit. All of what the governments of Scholz and uh, Macron, they are lying, they continue the colonial exploitation of the global south through the mechanism that debt is truly enabling. So we need to build, build power from the bottom up, as we said. And I think the question was also, well, uh, some countries may not have, may not be so exposed to the climate crisis, but may have a lot of debt. I was trying to think of any global South country that is not in a, a, like really highly impacted of the climate crisis. Africa, all of it. South America, all of it. Uh, Asia, most of it is flooded. We are droughts, fires. So um, it's hard to find that. And what we found is the debt, the financial debt, is in the hands of the global South governments. It's in the balance sheets of Argentina, South Africa, Indonesia. So as sovereign nations, they hold the power to not pay that back. And individually, that's an impossible task. But Thomas Sankara, who was calling for a united front against debt from the Global South, was assassinated shortly after because of that. And that's why we're mobilizing his memory on October 15th. It's the 35th anniversary of his assassination. He said it. I will be dead if we don't achieve this united force. That's what we want to do. We need to unionize, just like the power of the workers come from the unity of the workers. The power of the Global South to withhold this debt and to, to default on this debt can only be done together. But for that, our government, like Luciana will tell you, in Argentina, is progressive, but it's not. It's actually you know, legitimizing the, the loan with the IMF, approving it in Congress, and then sacrificing the countryside to fracking, mining, deforestation, offshore drilling, uh, monocultures, transgenics, Monsanto. So they are not on our side. We need to build power with the workers to force first the Global South governments on our side, and then build a union of that, a united front that can say to the IMF, no more, we are defaulting now. And now we force the IMF with your help in Berlin, Brussels, London, Paris, Zurich, in the centers of power in Washington, D.C., we can provide the leverage and the support that they need to be visible, to, be, to get it to the media. So it's not invisible, as is usually the case in the Global South. So that's what we need to do, and that's the strategic thinking. But canceling the financial debt is only the first step towards them acknowledging the climate debt. We need to get them to acknowledge the climate debt so that then we can talk about reparations and loss and damage. Because as we've been working a lot with people demanding reparations from the Rise Up movement in, in Uganda. We've been talking a lot during the G7. They were in Munich. And you know, they said, you know, if we get the reparations money and the loss and damage money now, it will go right into paying the debt. You understand? It's like putting water into a bucket with holes. So, First, you need to close the hole, and then you're going to fill the, the, the bucket. So, of course, it's a trap if they're going to give you money for that. So, it's just strategic thinking. It's the weakest link of the chain, and that's where we need to do, as uh, he was saying, a concrete goal, a concrete target. That's something we can do, and it's quantifiable because the debt, the numbers are very clear. So, we know how much debt we had. And lastly, I want to add to the, the question from the person from Ukraine, my two cents on this also. The food crisis, what is coming, the gas, the energy crisis, 
we also need to find a way to connect in, to the workers here in Europe, to the working class. And I know talking to them about Global South, that doesn't quite do it. But there is this exciting campaign in the UK called Don't Pay, uh, which is a similar idea to what I just said about the Global South uniting, uni unionizing and not paying together. I don't know how to do this, but what if we could find a way where people in Europe could default together, could withhold paying the services until the governments actually enforce a just transition, united with the Global South, defaulting on the loans, uniting against the corporate capitalism, against financial power, against the people that are truly responsible for the climate crisis, both with the worker class here and the working people in the Global South. I don't have the answer to that, but hopefully we can find it together. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban. Now, I will ask Simona to give also some answer because uh, several interventions, several questions were about workers and union. You have the floor. You have your yes, but uh, first of all, I want to say some words, uh, uh, answer to Anna and uh, the other sister who speak about uh, the war. Yeah. Um, CGL is uh, in very engaged for the peace and uh, we, we think that uh, world cannot be the solution of any problem. And uh, it's not only for, uh, ob obviously, it's sure to emission, but b because uh, it's, it's a shame of human life uh, world. And uh, one of the, our proposal also to um, act um, to um, finance uh, climate action is to cut uh, um, military expenses because uh, we, we know that uh, uh, this uh, is a, a very uh, big uh, problem. And um, with this uh, um, war between uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia, we are financing uh, with uh, our, with um, with the gas we are financing uh, Russia and uh, at the same time Italy, for example, is for uh, giving um, um, Ukraine war uh, weapon, weapon. So we don't agree with the, these policies. We want to cut uh, expenses for military and for war and we want to work for peace. This is my first question. Uh, about uh, trade union and what we are doing. Uh, we, we are working with uh, our associated uh, and uh, I want to tell that uh, there is no worker on one side and the other activist on the other. I think uh, almost of us are workers, maybe of yesterday, today or tomorrow, but we are all our workers because work is, job is the dignity for uh, human beings. So I think uh, we are all together. There is no difference. And uh, we are working uh, with the trade union international movement inside the climate movement. We work uh, with uh, all the trade un tra um, environmental association, like also the um, uh, syndicalist of uh, France say we work with the Greenpeace, uh, WWF, uh, with the Fridays for Future. We, we work all together. We, we, we know what to if only all together we can fight uh, against uh, all these economical, political, and the financial power. But um, I don't know if it's uh, clear for all what are our difficulties. Uh, before I speak of what are the, the measures that we need to ensure just transition. Um, we have we represent also worker who work in uh, places when in fossil fuel uh, or in automotive uh, um, plant so uh, we know that these workers have to lose their job uh, we don't say that they don't want to lose their job they have to lose their job because their job is the, is the problem but we have to take care of these workers. We have to give them another job, another job that could be in agriculture, uh, to uh, take care of ecosystem, in the hydrological system, in the um, 
health system uh, in uh, in other kind of job but for do that we need a big uh, investment a strong role of the state we have in europe a lot of money next generation who was uh, uh, doing to to make this change but uh, we are not using this money to make this change we are paying a lot of money to gas we are uh, giving in my country uh, money to people because of the high prices of the energy but uh, continuing to give money for gas and we are not investing on efficiency or renewable energy these are all uh, investment that create a lot of job but we are not doing so the same battle the same fighting that we have to do all together is to make a change at the same time, climate and social justice are together. It's not uh, one time and the second time. We have to do everything now, in this moment. And uh, it's the same for north, so south. We are, we are all together. For me, it's not uh, a problem of Italy, of Europe, of uh, Argentina. We are all together. We are all brothers. We have to fight all together. Thank you, Simona. Daniel, uh, so sorry, the the uh, gentleman who asked the question about the state and the workers, uh, I, yeah, that's, that's an absolutely uh, crucial question and uh, an important differentiation. Um, uh, yeah, so in terms of reparations, we talked about uh, the the demands that movements from the global south have made have been equivalent to about two to six percent of GDP. But what I was saying that that is obviously an unfair cost to put on the backs of workers in the global north who have uh, contributed far less to the crisis. Uh, but that does leave a huge question of who pays. Uh, I think it absolutely has to be the state that at least uh, raises and controls the finance because we can't, we can't trust BlackRock and uh, the World Bank and the IMF uh, and others to do it in a fair way. Uh, so there has to be state and national coordination of, of uh, that taxation, but it, it shouldn't be raised from taxation from the workers. It should be raised from the taxation on the fossil fuel companies. Uh, also, as the other contribution said, uh, you know, there could be taxations on international transport, uh, on the military. A good company that combines both of those things is Airbus, which has huge uh, like astronomic uh, annual CO2 emissions. Um, Research in the World Inequality Report uh, said that a 10% tax on wealth uh, across the global north could pay for global uh, adaptation costs for the whole of the global south uh, without much difficulty. Uh, so taxes on, on wealth and the super rich would be another way. So, so you're right, it's, there's a, a potential conflict in between asking states who are funded a, a little bit through taxation to pay for this, uh, but the, the, the additional question is how uh, much more kind of progressive taxation is, is introduced. Uh, and that is, a, that is a very big question because that comes down to how you pay public services and other things as well. Um, but yeah, I, absolutely, it doesn't have to start, stop at the fossil fuel corporations who are paying, you know, uh, there's reparations demands that can be made on agro industry, on the motor industry, uh, and we also want to look at demands for reparations from uh, financial institutions as well. Um, if you take BlackRock, which is uh, probably one of the biggest uh, private sector players in global debt, cancel, uh, in global debt um, that is also a, a huge climate criminal, a company that uh, finances uh, more emissions each year than most uh, countries, even in the global north. Uh, so taxes on financial transactions can also help contribute to this uh, and on the kind of massive wealth of these asset managers who are, who are draining the global south from these funds. Um, uh, but yeah, Leah, I, I think that, that's one reason why I don't think there is uh, any conflict between me and Esteban. Uh, Although we, I guess we have slightly different demands in the way we phrased it, uh, one for debt cancellation, one for reparations. In a lot of cases, we have the same targets. Uh, in a lot of the ways that groups from the Global South have talked about reparations, debt cancellation is always included as one, at least one part of that. 
And, and as Estuan said, there is actually a deep connection between these things as well. Uh, a lot of countries in the Pacific and in the Caribbean, small island states, uh, are forced into debt because of the lack of climate finance. So uh, one example in Mozambique, uh, three years ago, uh, two cyclones, Cyclone Kenneth and I die, uh, hit the country, uh, caused a huge amount of devastation to agriculture, to livelihoods and communities, and to workers. Um, and Mozambique wasn't offered any compensation for that, wasn't offered any uh, sort of grant aid. It had to turn to the IMF for a $120 million loan, uh, which you know, just added to its debt burden. And that was after Western corporations had already uh, sort of, uh, corruptly enticed the Mo Mozambican government into a huge uh, further uh, debt burden as well. Um, so loss and damage, in a, in a sense, can help to reduce the need for countries going into debt. Uh, but like you say, we can't just provide a load of climate finance whilst countries are playing uh, billions each year out to these financial institutions. You've got to kind of fix the hole at the bottom of, of the bucket, I guess, before you uh, fill it up. Um, but yeah, and also when we're talking about these movements, uh, you know, the, the global debt movement uh, that we work with uh, is hosting a, a, a week of action uh, between the 10th and the 15th of uh, October this year. That involves movement to a, a lot of part of, of, of this global debt movement, but which also articulate demands for proper climate finance, loss and damage, and climate reparations. Uh, and yeah, w uh, we'll be taking part in th those actions. There's kind of lots of uh, international online actions that you can get involved with. Uh, and uh, there'll be sort of uh, consecutive days of action on the 13th and the 14th of October, which I believe Esteban's also uh, leading actions as well. Uh, so I, I, I don't think it's necessarily the case that, uh, because sometimes we say different things, uh, that there's any conflict. I think, uh, you know, we need this big list of demands and solutions uh, that we can deploy uh, for different tactical and strategic regions at different times. Uh, but we absolutely need, you know, everyone inside the tent to kind of make these things happen. So, uh, yeah, very happy to work with you on that and, uh, and everyone else. <laughs> Thank Daniel. Ulrich. Thank you for this uh, questions and contributions. I think I need three to four minutes that you can calculate co for your coffee break or other necessities. First, uh, men, men as experts. The panel was supposed to organize with um, three cis women and three cis men and a, a female moderator. So uh, Christoph explained at the beginning, but the structural point I would say is that there is a lot of knowledge by women on, on climate crisis, climate policies and debt. So I, I um, would not excuse ourselves, but to, to clarify. The second is, um, yes, the question of military and war and cl emissions. We need research on this and po good political analysis. I would say this is a critical intervention to show how the, the new power game and the new wars are emitting CO2 emissions. Um, it, there is very little knowledge about it. I was looking for it, very, very little knowledge. And the third three point, and then I have three um, arguments at the end. Um, to Esteban, um, um, Gustavo Petro, the new president, elected president in Colombia, who took over two weeks ago the presidency, announced in his inaugural speech. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> Gustavo Petro announced that we should reconsider debt in light of the climate crisis. I would say this is a strong point uh, um, precisely when it comes to governments. Um, yeah, yeah. Concerning the, um, the question um, of the, uh, the energy question, the Ukraine war question and the right-wing forces, this is the moment when we need to formulate leftist answers. And they are there. The, the new head of the leftist party in Germany, Linkspartei, Martin Schirdewan, just announced this, that we need um, to deal with um, how fair is the energy transition, where does the money come from, who does the money uh, go to, that we have to, to question power, political power of the fossil um, 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 industry. This is the moment to do it and why the energy transition in Germany was de-accelerated, was not shut down completely, but was really by the, by the political forces de-accelerated. I think this is a, a moment to do it. The second is on offsetting, to be very short. Um, of course, the current form that northern players mainly, companies, can do 
continue to do what they are doing by offsetting emissions and to buy um, via reforestation and other and other things um, uh, to buy them out. This is the wrong way. But I would say if we are able, it's a very a first thought, if we are able to to change it from an offsetting as a power uh, within a power structure that the northern actors give the money into a right, a social right from actors in the global south, mainly the local actors, not the governments, yeah, the local actors, that they have to be compensated, then we are close to, to debt um, uh, uh, cancellation questions. So not the dominant logic of offsetting, but I would say the elites and know that they have to deal with this issue, but of course then in their ways, and we might counter it. It's just a first thought. And to, to conclude, um, the question also of the colleague of you, um, whether the climate question um, is now taking, taken up by trade unions and by other actors, or somebody said it's, it's too weak. My point is, it's not the question of a yes or no. It's a question of a how. Of course, the German trade unions and the Austrian trade unions are talking about social ecological transformations, about um, the, the climate crisis. But their answer, or they are part of an answer, of an ecological modernization of capitalism. Now, one could say, okay, of course, they, maybe they are too weak, but I would question trade unions, the German metal worker union, for example, when they cheer also for the replacement of the, uh, of the combustion engine via the electric engine. This is an ecological modernization, and of course, there are workers, and there, are, there, there is the power of the trade unions, but this is not enough. So my point would be not to say trade unions are hesitant to take up ecological questions, they take up the ecological questions and we should ask how and to push them when we are able that not to go for an ecological modernization of capitalism but to get uh, out of or beyond capitalism. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ulrich. Thanks all of you for your questions, your comments and uh, see you later in the other events. Have a good day.